not that uh, that Nehemiah carried out and uh, kind of a summary. And what I wanted to do was just look at some of these things because there's because they were a summary of what we've studied with regard to Nehemiah, there wasn't a lot of additional scripture. And so I thought as we go through this, we'd perhaps think about some things, um, particularly in, in view of uh, Sunday morning's presentation with our program of work and the things that, that we're going to strive t- uh, to do. And, um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, as I said Sunday, that, uh, that was a presentation of intent. That was not... That was not the program of work. Uh, it was given for the consideration of the church, and and uh, and I don't know. I haven't received any feedback. I don't know if, if anybody else has. Uh, I would assume that if nobody gives any feedback, that everybody's on board. And so, uh, but uh, we still got you know a few weeks uh, left in this year, and uh, the copies. I'll put these back on the back. But the copies of of the uh, projected program of work are here. And I probably will talk a little bit about that at the end of, at the end of this, or at least work it into uh, this particular discussion. Now, on the bottom of page 117, on Nehemiah's ten steps of encouraging and encouragement for groups, uh, you know, the very first thing is uh, is to lean on God, is to, to depend on God. And uh, <coughs> but this is not just this is not just an idea that that we have these ideas. Uh, that we want to that we want to carry out, and we're just going to do this, and we're just going to trust God that this thing's going to work, as, 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 or that it's going to come to fruition. Uh, there'll be other things that we'll talk about, starting on page one eighteen, um, that will be helpful to us. But again, so many you know, so many people they just make their plans, they make their plans, and they expect God just to bless their plans because their plans have good intentions. All right, and so we want to. I want to think in that in our mind. I want to kind of plant that seed in your mind that that people want to do good and they have good intentions, but they just expect God to help them or bless them based on their good intentions. All right, and so I want you to kind of think about that. But in uh, in that paragraph there, it says attempting goals without God is like walking a tightrope. Uh, without a net, and uh, I, I even thought I thought more along the lines of uh, something that Benjamin Franklin said, which I think is really apropos. As as the deliberations were being made uh, for the the birth of this nation, and uh, and uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin made this statement. He said, and he quoted Psalm one twenty seven. That says, except the Lord build a house, they do labor in vain that build it. And he drew the parallel to what they were trying to do in the establishment of, of this nation. And his point was, is that we need to pray and invoke the blessing of God on this and not to make our plans apart from what we believe to be the blessing of God. And he, he said, if, if we don't include God in our plans, he said, we'll be just like those people who build that house in Psalm 127. Now, he didn't say it like that. He's a whole lot more eloquent than I was. But that's the essence of what he said. That uh, if, if a person builds a house without God and he labors in vain, you know, how can we expect to build a nation without God? Because it'll be a, it would be a labor, a labor in vain. What's that? Look what's happened. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and and well, and also I think you can look at what happened then. You know, look at what happened then, and look at what's happening now. And I think a lot of that goes to just to chase a quick rabbit. It goes to God's natural law. You know, there are no, there are there are varying types of laws in the Bible. Uh, and for example, the proverbs. The proverbs were never given as a law. The Jews had a law. That was the law of Moses. That was given. You know, the Ten Commandments were given, and then the other six hundred and three thou shalts and thou shalt nots were added to those things later on. And that was the law. And you don't find any more laws given to God's people after that. 
You know, everything else is either a history, is either a history of God's people. Um, it is uh, the books of poetry uh, that many times will refer back to the law. And then you have the work of the prophets. And the work of the prophets was, was not to give people new laws, but was to call them back to the original law that God had given. That was the work of the prophets, was to, to call people back to God's law or to, or to encourage them in what they were doing that was good. And so, and so uh, <clears throat> but the Proverbs contain what are known as natural laws. In other words, there are things that anybody can do that are principled in the Bible that as a general rule, they will be blessed. And I'll give you, you know, the one I think of the most is the one that Dave Ramsey quotes the most in his radio broadcast, and that is from the Proverbs, the borrower is a slave to the lender. You know, he is a, he is a pay cash for everything kind of guy. Uh, and, and as a general rule, you know, is, is completely averse to even borrowing money to buy a car. You know, in, in his way of thinking, you know, the only thing a person should ever borrow money to do outside of some kind of emergency is buy a house. Most people can't save up enough money to, to pay cash for a house. But he quotes, he goes, because when you borrow money, you, know, you, place yourself, you place yourself under the control of, of the lender. And so, you know, Dave Ramsey, not a Christian in the New Testament sense, I, I know because I, I know a little bit about him, uh, but... That's true for everybody, right? The borrower is the slave of the lender. That's God's natural law. Um, you know, God's, uh, you know, God's uh, natural law for marriage, when, you know, when those things are followed as a general rule, good things happen. You know, there's a, um, you know, there, are, there are two things, by the way, and this is something I'd heard, but I hear it most from, from, uh, the pod, from Ben Shapiro's podcast. It says that there, there are two things uh, there are two things that every single person can do to avoid poverty. And one is finish high school. And number two, don't have kids until you're married. Said so if you do those two things, you have an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal uh, uh, chance of being in poverty. If you don't, if, if, you, if you finish high school and you don't have kids until you're married, chances are you will not be in poverty. So far as you know, the American sense of, of the word. And so, again, that's just a natural, you know, what we can find that in the Bible, right? You know, those saying, you know, God didn't give Adam a wife until he gave him a place to live and a job. Right? He had a place to live and a job before he got a wife. And so, you, you, so that's kind of a natural law. And if people will follow that, good things will happen to them. Good things will happen to them. And so those are God's natural laws, that anybody can be blessed by those things. In other words, following those general principles. Um, but of course, we've gotten away from that. You know, you know, as a nation, I mean, we've run up as a nation trillions of dollars in personal debt. You know, a trillion and a half dollars of, of student loan debt. Trillion and a half dollars. You know, when the last time I checked, you know, it was somewhere between five and eight thousand dollars per adult credit card debt and as I always say somebody got mine 18 now 18,000 wow 18,000 dollars per person per person which means somebody's got 36 because I don't have any I don't either. so somebody else got 36 you know and every, every one of you that don't have any somebody's got that means somebody's got yours and so that's a that's a that's an unthinkable number Think that, that you know how many people are toting around tens and tens and perhaps even hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit card debt, you know, and paying probably eighteen to thirty percent interest on it, and so it's just just a crazy number to wrap your head around. You know, by the way, you know that goes against God's natural law, but you know those people are they're going to be in financial difficulty. I mean that's just the way that it is, and so when you do what God says in the general realm good things will happen and when you don't do what God says bad things are going to happen and as a nation we've moved from trying to do what God says to try to move away away from what God says and I think any honest person can say it's not working out that great for us you know it's just it's just not it's just not helpful and so uh, and so I think I think that goes to what what you were talking about firm 
Um, you know, the awareness of God's presence and sustaining power undergirds meaningful day-to-day -day activity. You know, in other words, how, how often do we think about God as we go about just our day-to-day -day activity? You know, something I've tried to work on, and, and, and I'll just be honest with you, I have failed miserably, all right? Is, uh, it, you know, the Bible says that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, after talking about, you know, the doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, and, and doctrines of, of demons, you know, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving, for everything is good if it is received with thanksgiving. And, and I was talking with Bill about this back in October when I was in Texas. And I thought, you know, you know, if I go to a restaurant or I sit down, you know, if I sit down and I'm going to eat a meal, if I'm going to eat a meal, you know, I'm going to pause and give, I'm going to pause and give thanks for it. You know, but I don't pause and give thanks before I go over and grab a banana and eat it. Or, or a fiber, fiber bar or, or, you know, a granola bar. Well, you know, I'm I'm eating those things the same way the same way as I'm eating a meal, right? And I and what I was talking to Bill, I said, how much you know, how much more cognizant would I be of God's other blessings if I could just remember to thank God every time I put something in my mouth? You see, in other words, because you know, I'm kind of a browsing eater. You know, I don't usually eat any one big meal. I might eat four or five times a day. You know, just eat here and here and here and here along through the day. You know, how much better off would I be to give God thanks and remember to do that every single time? You know, even if it's just a banana or even if it's just an apple or an orange or, like I said, a, a granola bar or whatever you know, it might be. How much, how much more aware would I be in other areas of my life of the presence of God if I could remember to be thankful every single time I eat, you know, and I, I think there's something. I think there's something to it. And I'm working on it, but like I said, I failed. I failed miser miserably because, and I suspect that most of you are just like me. You know, if you go grab an apple out of the, out of the dish, you probably don't give thanks for it. But when you sit down to eat at the dinner table, you know, with your, with your wife or your family, it's just understood. You give thanks. And yet the very, same, the very same thing is taking place just on a smaller, just on a smaller scale. And so, so you know, those are the types of things that can help us. In other words, every, if every time I eat, I thank God, then there's going to be other times during the day that I'm going to think about God. You know, as a general rule, I've, I've told you all this a thousand times. When I drive, when I drive toward Hamilton... And I drive past the farm and I look over those horses and I see Bee Mountain in the background, I think about God. Because just there's just something that strikes me about that piece of property against that, that background. You know, every, time I, every time I see it, I, I, I thank God. The reality is, I should do that. And then every time I come back this way and turn left and see a brick house on the hill, you know what I ought to do? Thank God. You know, every time, you know, because I'm driving, I'm driving to my house. I'm driving to, you know, I'm driving to a place that that keeps me warm or cool or or safe or or whatever. In other words, I I'd be better off. It helped me to be more thankful, and and if if I'm aware of those things, then I become more keenly aware of the fact that I need God. More keenly aware of the fact that I need God. Well, nearly uh, every time I get in a car drive anywhere. It enters my mind. The safety aspect. Yeah, the safety. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to kill somebody by my driving. Right. Or I don't want anybody to kill me by their driving. Right. I want to be kept safe. Right. And, but I think about it just about every time. Yep. And that, another, another, that, that's one thing that that's, that has stuck with you. Yep. And, and, and it, that's good. I mean, that, that's good. Uh, I, I become more aware of those things whenever, like, if Rhonda's going to go to Nashville or, or she's going to travel somewhere. I say Nashville, you know what I mean. Going to Eloise's house. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I become aware of those things when, Ron, you know, when Rhonda's on the road, but I don't think nearly as much about it when I'm on the road. I guess I'm more worried about her dying than I am me. Well, Ben, you're talking about that. I, 
I went to Tuscaloosa today. Yep. On the way down there, uh, I'm just thinking, going this far, got this car, go in, and I can remember back when we young, they didn't need go to Tuscaloosa. They could afford to go to Duck. Mm -hmm. Much less drive 70 grandpa, miles to go to one. Grandpa and dad at home, my dad, you know. And here I am. I want to be thankful more, you know. Got yeah. Car and it's just amazing how much yeah. blessings we can have that we used to now. Yeah. I mean, one of my friend, one of my friends in Ghana, his his 15 month old baby died, and and could have been. Could have been saved with five dollars worth of medicine. My baby wouldn't have to die. Five dollars worth of medicine. You know, and you know how many, you know how many of us would even, you know, would even think, you know, along those lines. And yet, you know, the, you know, a, a huge part of the world faces that kind of stuff every single day, every single day. You know, and we have such access. You know, and you're right, firm. We ought to be thankful. You know, just every, even if you're sick, the fact that you can go to the doctor ought to make you thankful. And so, uh, just so many things, so many things we need to learn. We need to learn to lean on God. Uh, and then it talks about tap into His power through prayer. 17, 117 over to 118. Uh, I, I thought about some passages uh, that go with this, with this point. Um, in, um, <coughs> in Proverbs 3 and verse number 5 and 6. Proverbs 3. Verses 5 and 6. The text says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. We're talking about leaning on God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That's a great... Again, that's a proverb, but what a, what a marvelous statement of, of faith in God and, and our, our, rely, our incredibly uh, simple and yet complex reliance uh, on God. Uh, James chapter 1, you know, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. <coughs> you know, ha, you know, have you ever prayed for wisdom? Prayed for wisdom. You know, the Bible says, "If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God." And uh, and so you know, we we again depend on Him uh, for those things. Uh, Jeremiah ten twenty three: The way of man is not in himself; it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Uh, and so again, we learn leaning on God. Now, remember, I put a seed in your head about about intent. Remember. People have good intentions, and, and, because, and because they have good intentions, they expect that God will be pleased with their good intentions and bless them when they pursue their good intentions. All right? Now, I'm going to ask a question. Can any, and I'm going to give you a hint. It's, they're in the Old Testament. <laughs> in the Old Testament. Can anybody give me an account where somebody either did or attempted to do something because with the best of intentions, but it didn't work out too good for him. Uzzah. Uzzah. <coughs> Second Samuel 6. When the ox stumbled and the cart shook, Uzzah put his hand on the cart to do what? Steady it. Didn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall off and hit the ground. What happened to him, Walter? He died. He died. The Lord struck him dead on the spot and he died. All because Numbers 4 says, don't touch the ark. I mean, it's just that simple, right? Don't <coughs> touch the ark. All right, can somebody give me another example of somebody who did something with good intentions and it didn't work out too good for them? King Saul. King Saul. We brought back the best of, of the animals to sacrifice to the Lord, right? 1 Samuel 15. How'd that work for him, Kyle? Not too good. What ended up happening to him? Yeah, yeah. The throne was taken from his family. He ended up dying a violent death at the hands of his enemies. Lost, yeah, lost his blessing. The, the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. I mean, you know, a lot of bad things happened. Yeah. 
that, you know, the, the intentions were good. But God didn't bless them. I, I still got two more in my head. Somebody give me another one. That's true. That's true. But what I don't but I don't know if there's an intention involved there. Might be. Might be. He just flat out disobeyed God, and that didn't work out too well for him. Uh, what about Adam and Eve? Did they have good intentions? What, what does the Bible say? When she saw that the tree was good for food and desired to do what? Desirable to do what? Make one wise. I mean, she had good intentions. How'd that work out? Not too good. All right. Now, I'm going to give you one more. and let, I, I, I'm going to give you a hint. All right. Well, I hadn't thought about that one. That's a new one. That's a, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and, and, and uh, uh, having a child with Hagar, which produced Ishmael. His intentions were good, but that one surely didn't work out too well because we're still paying the price for that because the Ishmaelites are still a thorn in the flesh of every man. By the way, if you don't know who the Ishmaelites are, they're the Muslims. <laughs> so are, are they the people from which the Muslim faith has come out. And by the way, the Bible did say about about 3,000 years ago, or about, about 2,500 years ago, of Ishmael and his descendants, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him. And so, you know, what's going on shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. All right, so that's good, Kyle. I hadn't thought about that one. I, I'm going to give you a hint. This was a person who intended to do a thing that he thought was good, but before he got a chance to do it, he got cut off. He intended to do a thing that was good. By the way, that was good. It was good. But before he was able to do it, when I say he got cut off, I don't mean he got killed. I mean he got stopped. Oh, look at you. David intended to build a temple. A house for the Lord. David said, I live in this beautiful house. And the ark of God rests in a tent made out of curtains. So what am I going to do? I'm going to build the Lord a glorious house that's fitting for him. It's not, no, it's not right for me to live in this house and the Lord to have to dwell in that one. So then he asked Nathan about it, right? Nathan was his preacher. And Nathan said... Go and do all the intent of thy heart. Then what did the Lord say? What did the Lord say? Yeah, the Lord said, when did I ever ask you to build me a house? By the way, the Lord didn't tell David not to build that temple. The Lord told Nathan to go tell David not to build that temple. Because Nathan didn't seek the Lord before he gave David that advice. Nathan thought, man, that's a great thing to do. And your intentions are good. Surely the Lord will bless that. You just go do it. The Lord said to Nathan, no, you go tell David, I never asked for this, and you're not going to build it. In other words, he made Nathan undo the mess that he made. All right? Were David's intentions good? If you'll read 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 18 and 2 Chronicles, uh, 1 Chronicles 17 too, you'll find out that in both cases, Solomon said of that event, it was good that it was in my father's heart. It was good that it was in my father's heart. But he didn't have permission to do it. So God didn't bless it. And so learning to lean, lean on God and, and, and work with God's wisdom. All right, then number two, going back to Nehemiah, identifying needs. I mean, that's the first thing. You know, once Nehemiah got from, from the king's presence back to, to the land of his people, you know, the first thing he did was assess needs. What needs to be done? All right, and he spent three days identifying, uh, identifying needs. Uh, you know, you know, again, one thing 
You know, I think one thing that I think we do well in our planning sessions for our program of work is, is that we try to identify needs and try to meet those needs, whether it be the needs of this congregation or the needs of, of, of our brethren locally or in other places. And so identifying needs and not just uh, wants is, uh, is important. Uh, number uh, three, which goes with identifying needs, assessing the situation. You know, sometimes it might be the case that we can, we can identify needs or various needs, but our assessment tells us, for example, well, we can't do this. You know, we don't always get to do everything we need to do, right? I mean, and, and, and so once there's an assessment, in other words, all right, here, here's, what, here's what needs to be done. Now, can we do it? Sometimes we might determine... We can't do it, and we might need to, in other words, not do it maybe in a traditional or, or in a way that might first be proposed. We might have to find a, another way to do it. You know, find, you know, find an alternative route to, 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 meet, uh, to meet a need. Uh, number four, you know, make detailed plans. You know, Nehemiah had detailed plans for, uh, for the rebuilding of, of the walls of Jerusalem. And then... Uh, and then five was he was able to articulate that vision. Uh, you know that's always that's always a key uh, for any leader anywhere. Uh, to me, that was one of the things that made, you know, in my opinion, made Ronald Reagan a great president. Was he was able to articulate his vision for the country, and he was able to he was able to inspire people to to embrace the vision that he had for the country. And, and being able to do that made him, made him successful, all right? And so to have a plan and then to be able to articulate uh, the plan. Uh, then number six, delegate and organize. Uh, you know, Nehemiah couldn't rebuild those walls by himself. He had to have help. And so then there were assignments that were given and each man each man or each clan or each family was given a, a job to do and then they were left to do the work that they'd been commissioned to do. You know, Nehemiah could not micromanage the rebuilding of the walls. I mean, it was just too massive. It was just too massive of a project. You know, it's just like, you know, you know no president can oversee every single detail of the government. I mean, it's, I mean the government's just so massive, it's just impossible for any one man to you know, to know everything, you know, everything that's going on. And so you have to have the ability to, to, to delegate and to organize. And, and, and Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah was able to do that. Um, I thought about, uh, I wanted to know, I said I thought about, I wanted to note something here in number six. Uh, the uh, the second, uh, second sentence and the third sentence, I think, are important. It says, do not discourage willing workers... <laughs> With vague expectations. Notice when people, when people, as the text said, they had a mind to work. Nehemiah four and verse six. The people had a mind to work, but but Nehemiah was able to give them something specific that they needed to do. You know, it there, it wasn't some ambiguous, you know, some pie in the sky or, or ambiguous uh, plan. In other words, they knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing. You, you know, repairing, you know, what was called the water gate and the fish gate or, you know, the, you know, in other words, whatever your job was, it was articulated and you knew what your job was and you went and you did it. You know, you know, think about, you know, think about the work that, I think about the work that Sean, you know, Sean did for years and years in his uh, uh, drywall. You know, Sean didn't show up to a work job, a job site and, and, and start wiring things. One his job. You know, Sean's job was to be a, a drywall finisher. You know, and, and the electricians, you know, didn't sand they didn't sand the drywall and, and Sean didn't pull wire. Most of them messed it up. What's that? Most of them messed it up. They messed it up. Yeah, yeah, the, the electricians can mess up the drywall. That's right. <laughs> well, think about over where Moses was told to delegate out all that. Yeah, he tried to judge the people from daylight to dark. And, do and his father-in-law, you know, Jethro said, "You'll wear yourself out. You know, appoint, you know, appoint some people to get it to get it done." 
Uh, here's an important one, number seven. Expect criticism. Expect criticism. Without question. Without question. Moses was one <coughs> excuse me, of the greatest leaders who ever lived. Of any kind. Moses was one of the greatest leaders who ever lived. And yet, he was continuously being bombarded with criticism. The very first minute that he shows up in Egypt and tells Pharaoh, let my people go, then Pharaoh says, you must not have enough work to do sitting around here thinking about going out and sacrificing. I'm going to increase your workload, remember? You'll go out and gather your own straw, but you still got to make as many bricks as you did when we supplied the straw. And in Exodus chapter 5, at the end of that chapter, the people complain to Moses. You have made us a stench in the nostrils of the Egyptians, and you've made them want to kill us. So, so from the very moment Moses arrived on the scene, first his people criticized him. His people criticized him. Right? Then you get out into uh, then you get out into to Exodus when they got out of the land of Egypt. More than enough water to drink. Exodus 17, 5. You've brought us out here in the wilderness to kill us with thirst. What are we or how about this one? What are we going to eat? And then, once God provided them something to eat when he gave them the manna, we're tired of eating this. We want something else. It was just, it was just one thing after another. Then, in, uh, in Numbers uh, 12, the Bible says that Moses had married an Ethiopian woman. And then his brother and his sister... Aaron and Miriam criticized him. But rather than criticizing him for what he did, they tried to assume some of the authority that he had. They said, has God just spoken to Moses or has he not also spoken to us? In other words, hey, we're just as good as Moses. Well, that didn't work out too well. But I mean, his own brother and sister you know, criticized him. Then you get to Numbers chapter... Um, 12. Numbers chapter 12. Uh, uh, the sons of Korah complained, Moses, you've taken too much authority on yourself. In other words, we want, we want a little bit of authority. And so Moses said, all right. He said, tomorrow, tomorrow, you gather up your bunch and I'll gather up my bunch and we'll just let the Lord decide this. And he said this. He said, if you die the death of all men, then the Lord has not spoken to me. Now that should have given somebody a little room for pause, shouldn't it? If you die the death of all men, in other words, if you die of old age, you can rest assured that God has not spoken to me. Of course, what happened to them? The earth opened up and swallowed them up. They did not die like all men. And then three chapters later, here's what the people said to Moses. You have killed the people of the Lord. Like Moses had the power to make the earth open up and swallow them people. You've killed the people of the Lord. I mean, it was just one thing after another. Finally, at one time, Moses got so disturbed that he said to God, he said, you laid these people in my lap. I didn't give birth to these people, and yet you've laid them in my lap, and you want me to take care of them like, like, like a mom." I mean, I mean, Moses got fed up. He got fed up. In other words, the criticism, the criticism at times was just all but overwhelming. All but overwhelming. And in, in that particular case, and in the one where they worshiped the idol, God stepped in and helped Moses out. But, you know, when you do things, we can expect to be criticized. You know, sometimes people criticize us for the way that we do things when they themselves are not doing anything. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, that, not that that's always in, improper. I mean, there are people who can do nothing, and if we're doing a thing and it's wrong, we, we still should be corrected. But as a general rule, people that are doing nothing correct those that are doing something, and my general response is, well, 
Is the way that you're not doing anything better than the way that I'm doing something? Is your way better than mine? Of course, then the answer to that question is always no. You know, if you don't like the way I'm doing a thing, but you're doing nothing, don't tell me how to do it. You show me how to do it. You do something, let, and let me see how to, and how how to get it done. And so, and so, uh, uh, always expect uh, criticism. All right, uh, Lord willing, next uh, next Wednesday we'll go to uh, Barnabas. Barnabas, by the way, whose nickname has the word encouragement in it. And so that'll be uh, page 121, lesson 11. We'll look at, we'll look at Barnabas, Lord willing, starting next week.